most of us, you don't get balls in red cups. Yeah. And I know that's what you're looking for. Take your Bibles, if you haven't already got them open, to um, Matthew chapter 10, verse 17 is where we're going to begin. A um, couple of things I need to explain, and hopefully I can do it quicker than the first service, because it took me forever in this first point, which was really sad, because it's not that big a deal. Um, you need to understand that Matthew has organized his information according to themes, which means that sometimes he'll take it from one of Jesus' sayings, which is in the present text, tense, and then other times he'll take it from Jesus' um, advanced warning about what's going to happen in the future, and so it'll be in the future tense. That's exactly what's going on here, because um, if you remember from last week, Jesus is preparing the ambassadors to go out as sheep among wolves, and everything is present tense. This text is in future tense, which means that it's coming from a different part of Jesus' sayings, but Matthew has grouped them all together because it has to do with our going out into the world as sheep among wolves. We're to be as wise as serpent and as uh, shrewd as snakes, if you remember from last week. And so Jesus is talking about uh, what it means to go out into the world in this particular uh, uh, text. You, you get an immediate sense of that because if you remember from last week, um, Jesus told the, the disciples when they went out to not go to the Gentiles, to go only to the lost sheep of Israel. Where here, he's specifically talking about going to the Gentiles, which we know was going to be a future um, mission of what uh, Jesus was, was talking about. Um, in verse 23, let me read it real quick, the part that's uh, the trouble part. Verse 23, the second half, which goes like this, I tell you the truth, you will not finish going through the cities of Israel before the Son of Man comes. Some people call this the most troublesome text in all the New Testament. I look at it as no-brainer. <laughs> um, the reason it's troublesome to theologians is because they want to know exactly what the time is when Jesus is coming, which I think misses the whole entire point. I think what Jesus is saying is, you need to be always ready because you're never going to have a definite point in which you're going to know I'm going to come back. And so until you, this is something you need to be always ready for. But we in our Western civilization, in our post-enlightenment thinking, in our wanting to take control of things, we want definite information. Folks, it's not there. And in fact, I really think we've screwed up the whole end times uh, prophecies of Jesus um, entirely by trying to find definite information and definite, definite periods of time and definite sequences of events and definite charts we can put of our, on our wall to know definitely when Jesus is coming, when Jesus all the time is saying, be ready. We're going to spend a lot of time on that. Actually, three Sundays on Matthew chapter 24 that is exclusively about the end times. Um, and I'm going to say the same thing all three Sundays. <laughs> so... But don't get it in your head, you can only come one and skip the other two. <laughs> Gee, I just really blew that. And I, I think Jesus is saying the same thing in order to warn us about uh, how we can easily be sucked into to, uh, looking at de different dates, dates and times. In verse 29, there's a really interesting uh, illustration that Jesus uses. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny, yet one of them will not fall to the ground apart from the will of your father. I always thought that as uh, somebody just got done with a 12 gauge and a sparrow at point blank range, you know. <laughs> the first service didn't get appreciate my illustration at all either. Um, Buddy understands. I, I always thought that that was a picture of a sparrow that had been picked out of the air, maybe by a, a bird of prey. You ever watch a sparrow get picked out of the air by a hawk? Or, it's really amazing. It, it is awesome. Zoom, they're gone. Um, never mind. I would tell a story, but that has nothing to do with today's message. Um, I always thought that this was some tragic event in the sparrow's life. The Greek word for fall can mean anything in which the sparrow touches the ground. In, the, in other words, it could mean just as simply the sparrow had been flying and come down. And it could even mean that the sparrow just made a hop. The God of the universe cares about a sparrow's hop. If a God of the universe cares about a sparrow's hop, which there's two for a penny, what is our problem? 
He cares deeply about you, the pinnacle of his creation. He cares deeply about you. And the only reason we don't understand how deeply he cares about us is because we're on such a totally different wavelength. It doesn't resonate with us how much he cares. Kind of like you when you were four years old saying, why, why, to your parents when they were trying to tell you what to do. None of you did that. I can tell you all the halos above your heads. You all were perfect kids. Your halos all just corroded. <laughs> because some of you actually believed that you were perfect in your childhood. I know children better than that. We all were jerks. <laughs> Still are. If God cares about a sparrow's hop, and he goes on to say, oop, verse 30. Even the hairs of your head are all numbered. The average number of hairs on a person's head is 140,000. Which means some of you have significantly more than that. Because some of you, I can count those hairs. <laughs> we won't count certain people's heads. <laughs> what Jesus is saying is, the God in the universe goes, oh, Pastor Keith just lost a hair. Another one. And some of you in the shower, God's going, oh, they lost 40. <laughs> Do you understand what he's saying? If the God of the universe keeps track of such insignificant and meaningless trivia as the hairs on your head and whether a sparrow hops or lights on the ground or not, What's your problem with thinking that he cares for you and is going to watch over you as you enter into the world with its fallen world syndrome? You enter into a world that is directly and completely opposed to you. Why are you worried? Because your father cares for you. Listen very, very carefully as Bob Gabriel comes and reads from Matthew chapter 10, verses 17 through 31. Thank you, Pastor Keith. It made this reading a whole lot easier. <laughs> Would you stand out of respect for the reading of his holy word, please? Matthew 10, beginning at verse 17. Be on your guard against men. They will hand you over to the local concerts, consuls and flog you in their synagogues. On my account, you will be brought before governors and kings as witnesses to them and to the Gentiles. But when they arrest you, do not worry about what to say or how to say it. At that time, you will be given what to say. For it will not be you speaking, but the spirit of your father speaking through you. Brother will betray brother to death, and the father his child. Children will rebel against their parents and have them put to death. All men will hate you because of me. But he who stands firm to the end will be saved. When you are persecuted in one pay place, flee to another. I tell you the truth, you will not finish going through the cities of Israel before the Son of Man comes. A student is not above his teacher, nor a servant above his master. It is enough for the student to be like his teacher, and the servant like his master. If the head of the house has been called Be Beelzebub, how much more the members of his household. So do not be afraid of them. There's nothing concealed that will not be disclosed, nor hidden that will, be not, that will not be made known. What I tell you in dark, speak in the daylight. What is whispered in your ear, proclaim from the roofs. Do not be afraid of those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both the soul and the body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from the will of the Father. And even the very hairs on your head are all numbered. So don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. <laughs> the powerful, powerful word of the Lord. You may be seated. 
If you want to pull out your sermon online, we're going to be going through that. I will warn you, the first point's going to take a little longer than points three, four, two, three, and 4. We'll go quickly. Even though point 4 has three parts to it, it shouldn't take that long. But I would encourage you to uh, fill in the blanks, both because it helps keep you awake, which is always a good thing. And then second, um, I purposely have you fill in the blanks of uh, words that I think are key to understanding what the, the, I believe the text is saying here. Question to be answered is this. Why does Jesus give us all these dark warnings to those who would be his ambassadors? I believe the answer is this. Jesus told us he was sending us as his ambassadors as sheep among wolves. That's what he said last week. Therefore, forewarned is to be forearmed. Jesus does not want us to be stupid, ignorant, and foolish sheep. He wants us to be wise. He wants us to be alert. He wants us to pay attention to the times. He wants us to know the signs of the times. He wants us to be wise, informed, shrewd. Um, wants us to be wise, informed, shrewd, prepared, and intelligent sheep who have learned to trust in the Lord for all we need to thrive on this planet with its fallen world syndrome. This world is going to be against Christ. This world is going to be against you the closer you are to Christ. In fact, you can pretty much look at it as a, a proportional relationship. The closer you get to Jesus, the wor- more the world is going to be against you. And so if you're not suffering much, it could be that you have a way to go before the world identifies you as, an, as a believer and finds you as directly opposed to their fallen world syndrome, their fallen world system, their fallen world agenda. But as we get closer and closer to Christ, the truth of Christ becomes more evident in our lives and truth hurts. And some people can't handle the truth, as that famous line in that movie had to say. The word for the day is prepare. God wants us to be prepared to handle the difficulties in our lives. I'd like to give a, an illustration that I think uh, talks about how Jesus is being very, very candid and very, very open to us about what we're going to face if we're believers. There was one time um, in the United States, only for 17 months, an organization that was very, very brutal to be a part of is called the Pony Express. The Pony Express only was in operation for a very, very short time until um, April 3rd, 1860, until November 18th, 1861. Just 17 months is all the Pony Express was in in operation. And it was basically to take uh, information from uh, Missouri out to Sacramento, California. And they had a, a series of riders that would pass along this information. Each rider would have to ride between 75 and 100 miles a day. They would change horses every 15 to 20 miles, and they would quickly take information from Missouri to California at the rate of $2.50 an ounce. So those of you who Skype to people around the world for free really should appreciate what you have (laughs) because it used to cost dearly to send information just from Missouri to California. Here's the the thing with being a, a Pony Express rider. You were required to be very, very light so the horses could be fast. You were required um, to not wear heavy clothing in order to to provide wind resistance so that you could outrun the Indians (laughs) and also so you could be faster in order to allow the news to travel from uh, Missouri to California more quickly. It was dangerous work. There was Indians involved, there was hazardous, in fact, you were required to go in your shirt sleeves even in the months of December and January in order to make sure that you didn't offer any more wind resistance than was necessary in order to, this was brutal work. And yet there was no shortage of riders. I want to read you a um, advertisement in the um, San Francisco newspaper printed in 1860. This was the advertisement looking for riders for the Pony Express. This is what it said. Wanted. Young, skinny, wiry fellows not over age 18. Must be expert riders willing to risk daily. Orphans preferred. There is a warning of what kind of job you're getting involved with. 
Do you understand that Jesus is giving you a similar warning if you choose to be his ambassador? Because this world, the more this world discovers you are a believer and the more you hold to Jesus' agenda and to Jesus' values, the more the world will find itself opposed to you. Because the world's agenda, the world's value system is diametrically opposed to Jesus' agenda. And they are not compatible. And folks, what's really, really interesting in our day and age is this. The world is wanting desperately to find tolerance. But it is becoming increasingly intolerant to those that don't find their tolerance according to the values of the world. And I don't know if you've noticed or not, but it, it is getting more and more uh, dangerous to be an outspoken believer. And the, to voice the heart of God, to voice the values of God is becoming more and more uh, risky, like riding a pony through Indian, Indian territory in the middle of winter. And Jesus is not trying to cover it up and to make it uh, sound like it's going to be smooth sailing and easy to do. He's telling us in advance what it's going to be like, and that's why we need to be prepared. Okay, number one. As an ambassador, oh, this quote from John Wooden. You know John Wooden. He was a coach of uh, UCLA basketball. They won like 10 of 11 years, won the NCAA uh, championship in basketball. How many have heard of John Wooden? More on this side than this side. Are you people not like basketball? John Wooden was an unbelievably cool guy. He was a believer, a staunch uh, believer in Christ, and just to a very, very uh, wise person. But he said this, failing to prepare is preparing to fail. And it's true in basketball, it's true in the Christian walk as well. And folks, hear me. This message is for believers. It's not for people who are not Christians. So if you're not a Christian, you have permission to fall asleep. If you see your neighbor going to sleep, you can assume... That'll keep the people on the fence awake. <laughs> now, this one has permission. <laughs> as an ambassador of the device, device of Christ, number one, as an ambassador of the device of Christ, be prepared for a world that hates you. Listen, this week, not so much are you going to understand that Jesus is a def divisive Messiah. Next week, it's going to be very, very clear because Jesus himself is going to tell us that he's a divisive Messiah. He tells us, I did not come to bring priests, but I came to bring a sword. The Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12 and 13, the word of God is like a sword, dividing the very intentions of our hearts, dividing bone and marrow. It's there, the word of God is there in order to cut us open, to reveal our hearts, to expose us. And folks, there are people who hate being exposed. The God of the universe knows that's the only way we're going to come to him is when we see our sinfulness, we see our desperate need for a savior, we hunger and thirst for righteousness, we mourn over our own sinfulness, we find ourselves poor in spirit because we know we're not the way we should be and it drives us to Christ. As an ambassador of the device of Christ, be prepared for a world that hates you. Look at verses 17 and 18. Be on your guard against men. They will hand you over to local councils and flag you in the synagogues. On my account, you will be brought before governors and kings as witnesses to them and to the Gentiles. Verse 21. Brothers will betray brother to death and a father is child and children will rebel against their parents and have them put to death. All men will hate you because of me. All men will hate you because you're part of Christ. And I believe the closer we are to Jesus, the more we exhibit the character of Jesus in our lives, the more the fallen world syndrome takes effect and the more the world hates us. There's a, a phrase that I hear on a lot of Christian and uh, cultural environments and I understand what they're saying but I always get a little nervous when I hear it it's the terms positive and encouraging yes 
The gospel is positive and encouraging for believers. But folks, it is irritating and disgusting for unbelievers. And the more we show the light of Jesus, you know, light attracts bugs, don't you? And the more we're the light, the more bugs are going to be attracted to us to try to snuff out that light. I, I gave this illustration about eight months ago, so I feel some license to be able to use it again. Um, there was one time a missionary that was in the deepest part of Africa, and the missionary took a mirror in order to be able to shave um, for himself. And a witch doctor, for the first time in the, in the witch doctor's life, saw this mirror and went and looked in the mirror and saw himself for the first time. <gasps> and he jumped back because he'd never seen himself like this, especially this clear. And he asked the missionary, how much for that magic window? And the missionary said, I don't want to sell it. I, I brought this purposely from the States in order to be able to watch myself so I could shave. Said, and the witch doctor says, no, no, I must have it. And the price got higher. And so finally the missionary said, sure, I'll say to that. And it sold it to the witch doctor in which the witch doctor immediately took the mirror, threw it on the ground and stamped on it and broke it to make sure he could never see himself again. Why? Because he couldn't stand the way he looked when he looked in the mirror. Folks, that's what God's word does. God's word is a mirror that allows ourselves, if we read it honestly and with integrity, allows ourselves to see ourselves as we really are and to make us what Jesus talked about at the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, to make us poor in spirit, to make us hunger and thirst for righteousness, to make us mourn over our inability to be the people that we know that we should be as children made in the image of God. And we don't look at it that way. I always get a little nervous when people always say, well, I love to read the Bible. It brings me so much comfort. <laughs> yes, there are definitely comforting words. I will give that. And I, I love to read those passages when I go to the nursing homes, when somebody's dying. I love to read those passages. But folks, 80% of the scriptures are unnerving. I've told you before, I'll tell you again, I don't have my Bible with me because it's too big and bulky, but it used to be, up until about age 30, that this part of my Bible, Genesis to Psalms, you, you could look at the edge and there's all dirty and ruffled. You knew I spent a lot of time there. And then from Matthew to the end of Bible, it was all dirty along the edges and ruffled. But this part from Isaiah to Malachi, clean as a virgin. You know why? I didn't want to read it. It was hard. And so I just avoided it. I didn't want to look in the mirror. You want to know what kind of Christian you are? Are you reading Isaiah through Malachi? Pastor, uh, I'm sorry, Pastor Buddy. <laughs> well, in some ways he's a pastor. Uh, Buddy Briggs is offering a course on, on some of the minor prophets, those passages you don't want to read. I would encourage you. There's some really, really heavy stuff in there. I would encourage you to t seriously consider taking that course. Uh, first quote under, under number one, Augustine says this. Augustine was right when he said that we love the truth when it enlightens us, but we hate the truth when it convicts us. Maybe we can't handle the truth. And then look at that last quote in that section number one. The further a society drifts from the truth, the more it will hate those that speak it. That came from George Orwell. Not necessarily an outstanding Christian. But he's spot on. The, more, the further a society drifts from the truth, the more it will hate those that speak it. You know, there's a possibility that the reason why um, the Ten Commandments are not allowed to be posted in government buildings, I, I, found, this as, I found this rather intriguing. You know, do not commit murder, uh, do not steal, do not lie, all those kind of things. You know, they're not to be posted inside of government buildings with lawyers and politicians. You know why? It creates a hostile working environment. 
I've been fascinated to watch the developments in West Michigan. I don't know how many of you get West Michigan news. My wife and I watch the TV news at 10 o'clock each night um, from West Michigan because it's a half hour news thing at 10 o'clock so we can get to bed by 10.30. Um, but in West Michigan, there are two Michigan legislators who have uh, committed, adult, man and woman, committed adultery, forsaken their own uh, partners and committed adultery and they're trying to figure out whether they knew, used uh, Mich Michigan money in order to cover it all up, state money. What's been fascinating to me is that they were both very outspoken Christians that were for family values. Now, the, uh, the party from which they're in, in Allegan, uh, wants them both to resign because they really feel their witness is gone, that their, their message no longer will be heeded. In fact, it's been negated. But they really are wondering what the big deal is. If I ever am unfaithful to my wife, I will resign. You don't have to ask me. Preaching the word of God is far too important for it to be shilly-shallied like that. And unfortunately, we have diminished the power of the gospel by having people who say they promote it undermine the very power of the message by their own lives. And if you ever have to come and point in my chest like Nathan had to do with Daniel and say, you're the man, I will resign. And if I don't, you make sure I'm kicked out. Because folks, that is the problem with the power of the gospel in America. We have diminished the power of the gospel by our behavior and by our actions. We are not prepared to take the gospel into the world. We don't understand the cost. We don't understand the urgency. We don't understand the power. We don't understand how crucially important it is that the world hear our message. And that's why Jesus is saying what he's saying. I know last week I gave you some information that a lot of you probably struggled with all week long about how I don't uh, necessarily beg people to come to Jesus. I just think that's horrid. As if Jesus weren't enough on his own, we have to beg people to come to Jesus. Folks, truth be known, you're commanded to come to Jesus. And if you're not willing to come on your own, when you understand what he's done for you, then quite frankly, you deserve to go to hell. We need to be prepared. <laughs> so much of 21st century American Christianity reminds me of the early uh, Western European expeditions to the Arctic. Um, Annie Dillard, in a book called um, An Expedition to the Pole, talks about how these Western Europeans were going to the Arctic and really totally unprepared for what they were going to face. This is uh, out of her book. Each sailing vessel carried an auxiliary steam engine and a 12-day supply of coal for the entire projected two- or three-year voyage. 12 days of coal, two- to three-year-old vo voyage. Okay? Instead of additional coal, each ship made room for a 1,200 volume library. I, now, five of you reacted the way it was supposed to be. You went, what do you need a 1,200 volume library on a ship that's going to the Arctic? It, goes, it gets better. A hand organ played 50 tunes, which was on every ship. Every ship had fine china place settings for officers and men cut glass wine goblets, and sterling silver flatware. The expedition carried no special clothing for the Arctic, 
only the uniforms of her, mas- uh, her Majesty's Navy. Years later, Inuit Eskimos came across frozen remains of the expedition. They were men dressed in their finery and pulling a lifeboat laden with place settings of sterling silver and a load of chocolate. What does that tell you? <laughs> Besides they lo- the fact that they liked chocolate, they were ill-prepared for what they were coming to. They didn't consider the cost of what it was going to take to go to the Arctic. They didn't bring with them the necessary provisions in order to survive, in order to thrive. Folks, that is where the 21st century American church is right now. We are ill-prepared to face the challenges that we're going to be forced to face. And we need to buck up and get rid of our chocolate and get into the Word of God. But if you can enjoy chocolate from time to time, it's okay. (laughs) I'm just saying we're too soft. We're too lazy. We're too ill-prepared to face what the God of the universe has told us through His Son we're supposed to be facing. And I think one of the main reasons why we're not facing it is because we're not that close to Jesus. We're not standing out as a light to the world. Two. And two, three, and four will go a little quicker. As an ambassador for Christ, be prepared to submit to Christ and his spirit when you are under pressure. 19 and 20 from our text today. But when they arrest you, do not worry about what to say or how to say it. At that time, you will be given what to say. For it will will not be you speaking, but the spirit of your father speaking through you. This really comes across in the book of Acts. In Acts chapter 2, um, the, the disciples get God's spirit and they're able to speak in tongues to the people and proclaim the gospel even in, in voice, uh, tongues they didn't understand themselves. But I think there's even a, a more powerful uh, example for me anyway from Acts chapter 4 in which Peter and John are dragged before the Sanhedrin because they've been proclaiming the gospel in the temple and they've been forbidden by the Sanhedrin to go into the top temple and preach. And there they are, Peter and John before the Sanhedrin. Remember, the Sanhedrin is what killed Jesus. They're the guys that turned Jesus over to the Romans to be crucified. So Peter and John know that that could be happening to them. And so the Sanhedrin are questioning Peter and John. And you remember, Peter and John give these amazing answers, just full of confidence and boldness. And the Sanhedrin is, is, is shocked at how they speak. And the Sanhedrin says, they took note that these boys had been with Jesus. Jesus was speaking through them. Jesus was speaking with confidence in their voices because they'd been with Jesus and had that assurance. Folks, when we're pressed against the wall, when we're before the judges, when we're in the media, when we're being forced to take a stand for what we believe, that's when your time alone with Jesus ahead of time will shine. You don't need to think about what you're going to say. Your time with Jesus will t- show you what to say. I, I don't know if you remember uh, years ago, the, uh, center field, I think he played center field for the uh, Minnesota Twins. His name was Kirby Puckett. Kirby Puckett was a really outstanding player. All-stars, 10 years running, uh, six times gold glove award winner, um, three point, uh, I'm sorry, 313 batting average, just, and a very vocal Christian. There was one game in which he was playing the Cleveland Indians and uh, the, the uh, pitcher for the Cleveland Indians, whose name was Dennis Martinez, a pitch got away from him and a fastball hit Herbie Puckett right in the cheek and absolutely destroyed this part of his face. So he was out for the rest of the season and actually hurt him for, for a long time because this part of his face was destroyed. And Dennis Martinez was just waiting for uh, Kirby Puckett to lash out against him. But in his first media interview after the, the, he being hit by the pitch, Kirby Puckett said, my friend Dennis Martinez didn't mean to do that. And besides, I should have got out of the way anyway. And a lot of people took note of that. Because in the sports world, if somebody gives you an injury that knocks you out for the season, the, the person that's been injured is very, very bitter and very, very upset. But Kirby Puckett had the grace of Jesus in his speech and it became evident to everyone. When you find yourself pressed against the wall, your time with Jesus will come out naturally. But you must be with Jesus ahead of time 
before it ever come out when you're under pressure. You need to spend time with Jesus now so that when your back is against the wall and you have a chance for the real you to be exposed, the real you will show Jesus and not yourself and your vindictiveness. But if you don't spend time with Jesus now, it'll never come out later. You must know and see in the light now what it means to have a relationship with Jesus so in the dark times, that light will come through. Number three. As an ambassador of Christ, prepare and advance when it is an appropriate time to skedaddle. I love the word skedaddle. I had to use it. I know some of you are going, Pastor Keith, you are weird. I'm just looking for anything that will make you remember. Yeah, I'm desperate. <laughs> Look what he says in verse 10, 23. But when you are persecuted in one place, flee to another. I tell you the truth. You will not finish going through the cities of Israel before the Son of Man comes. There are a whole variety of interpretations for verse 23, but I think the big thing that Jesus wants you to understand here is be always ready. Be prepared. Now, listen. You, we need to talk. Sometimes Jesus is saying, as he does earlier in the text that we're looking at today in verses 17 through 21, sometimes he's saying, stay put, be strong, take a stand, and come before the governors, come before the, the leaders, Take your lumps. But he also is saying in this verse, sometimes you need to get out of there. So which is it? It's both. Do you remember Ecclesiastes 3.1? There is a time for everything under the sun. There is a time to stray and take your lumps and suffer and be persecuted and there's a time to skedaddle out of there and avoid the persecution. And folks, no one can tell you what that time is except the God of the universe. I can't tell you. Your spouse can't tell you. Your parents or your children or your next door neighbor or your pastor can't tell you. That is why you need to spend time with Jesus. That's why you need to prepare in advance and have the, the resources in your heart and your mind that will give you the answer of wisdom that you need. Do you remember, remember Ecclesiastes 3.1 is part of wisdom literature. There are no easy answers in the wisdom literature. Wisdom literature is there in order to prepare you for the hard times. That's why the b wisdom literature begins with the book of Job. And there's no right or wrong answer. There's no cut and dry answer. You need to prepare in advance to hear from the, spe from the Spirit when you come across these kind of different uh, situations you're going to face. I used to tell kids in youth group, and Pastor Dave, I'm sure, does it his way. But I used to tell kids in youth group, listen, you don't wait until you're in the backseat of the car with your girlfriend in order to decide whether or not you're going to go all the way or not. It's way too late to make that decision. Your passions, your emotions, your, your fondness, the heat of the moment is going to take over your rational thinking. You need to make that decision months ahead of time. Do you understand that there's decisions in your life that you're going to have to face in the next year, next decade, next 20 years? There are decisions you need to decide today how you're going to respond when you face those situations so that you'll be prepared and not respond out of the heat of the moment. Because our emotions are way too powerful to, to flirt with that way. And they will dictate the choice that you make unless you decide early. I need to move on. We need to take communion today to celebrate the, the Lord of the universe's uh, provision for us here. Uh, number four. As a fearless, courageous, hope-filled ambassador of Christ, prepare now to never forget in the dark why you chose in the light to be an ambassador of, for Christ. I believe that's what verses 26 through 30, 31 are sharing with us. And I believe there's three different ways that we need to understand what Jesus is showing us now to not forget. One, uh, I'm sorry, 4A, truth will prevail. The truth will always win. I don't know if you've seen this or not, but I've lived long enough to be able to see where our culture has militated against God's word. Our culture has said, no, God's word is, is unfaithful here. God's word's not true here. 
And I've lived long enough to see those lies be exposed for what they really are. Now, I know there's things coming our way right now, especially with the whole uh, cultural agenda on what's right and wrong sexually. Folks, God's word will, reveal, will uh, reveal itself to be true. It may take 20, 30, 40 years in order for our culture to catch up. But folks, it will happen. Truth will always prevail. You may look like a fool for the next 20 or 30 years before we finally catch up with the truth. But it will always happen. For A, truth will prevail. For B, fear God and not men. What can men do you? That's why I had our call to worship from Psalms 56. All men can do to you is kill you. And you're saying, well, th gee, that's pretty final. No, it's not. That's the whole point. That is the world trying to shove down your throat its agenda about what your life is all about. It's trying to get you to think that your 70, 80, 90 years in this world are all there is. And the God of the universe is trying to say, no. Your life is so much more than your 70, 80 years on this earth. And there's so much more that you need to invest in what's going to be for eternity, not just the 70 or 80 years. And unfortunately, we've bought into the world so much that we put all our eggs in this basket, and folks, the odds are still one out of one. You're not going to make it out of this world alive. So invest in the next world where moth and rust do not destroy, where thieves do not break into steel. The God of the universe wants you to make wise investments in your life. And we have listened to the world way too much. We fear the voice of man rather than fear the voice of God. We fear and take to heed the, the voice and the words of man rather than heeding and taking to heart the voice of God. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Please do not lean on your own understanding. But in all, all, all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. 4C. God in his sovereignty, providence, omnipotence, omnipresence, omniscience, compassion, patience, grace, mercy, forgiveness, and love cares for you. If he cares whether or not a sparrow hops on the ground, do you don't think he cares about you? If he cares enough about you to count the hairs on your head, which you have no clue how many you have. And if you do, you're pretty sick. <laughs> because most of us don't care enough about how many hairs are... Do you know the God of the universe does? And if he cares about how many hairs you have left on your head... How much more does he care about your spirit? How much more does he care about your life? How much more does he care about your goodwill and your benefit and your well-being? And the only reason, I'm going to say it again until the day I die, and probably be a hundred thousand more times unless I die today, and then this will be the last time. Okay, some of you are going to kind of catch up with that. The God of the universe loves us far too much to allow us to stay where we are. And the only reason we don't see his love in the midst of trials and troubles is because we don't see his agenda. We're not on the same wavelength. The more we get in touch with Jesus, the more we can become like the Apostle Paul. And we say that, and we can become like Joseph. What you meant for evil, God meant for good. In the Apostle Paul, all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. Can you say that about things? I know when I get a flat tire, I go, why? And God's looking at me and says, you need patience. Is that too painful to look in the mirror? Or what, what's the strange reaction that I'm getting from people here? <laughs> Folks, it's reality. If God controls whether or not a sparrow flies to the earth and hops on the ground, you don't think he cares about your flat tire? He, you don't think he cares about the person who just cut you off? You don't think you, he cares about the person that hurt you and offended you at work? You don't think he cares about the, the relative that's trying to cheat you out of your inheritance? 
I'm telling you, the God of the universe knows everything that's going on in your life better than you do. We just don't trust him. Worship point is this. Worship the God of the universe who loves you far too much to allow you to stay where you are and who also allows you to face circumstances where you are forced to grow and mature through trusting him. <laughs> I did it to my children because I love them. I'm doing it to my grandchildren. Sometimes they're doing it to me. Wow, I can't believe I just said that. We are pushing each other towards excellence. We are pushing each other to be more mature. My grandchildren know how to push grandpa's buttons. And every time I, they try to push grandpa's buttons, it sh shoots a red flag in my mind going, what would Jesus do? What would Jesus do? And I'm encouraging them to walk the walk of Jesus as well. Because some of them are only one years old and they haven't figured that out yet. He allows you to face circumstances where you are forced to grow and mature through trusting in him. The gospel application is this. Assurance and the hope that we have in, to face a fallen world syndrome with confidence, courage, grit, and joy comes only through faith in Christ and the message he gives us of a loving father who cares deeply for you. Who cares deeply for you. Who cares much more deeply than you do for yourself. Spiritual challenge, be prepared. And that's the big thing that Jesus is gonna tell us, not only here, but also in Matthew chapter 24. Be prepared, know that you are going to be immersed in the dark, but never lose in the dark what you knew to be true in the light. There's statistics that have been running around for the last 15, 20 years that more Christians have died since 1900 till now than have for the first 1900 years of Christianity. And folks, I haven't seen any statistics, but I know with what's happening in Syria and Turkey and in those areas, in fact, I just heard uh, Rick say that uh, ISIS has found a new way to uh, exterminate Christians. Um, I know by what's happening now, the, the statistics may be crowded even more, that there may be more Christians that have died from 1950 to now than have for the first 1950 years since Jesus uh, walked this earth. In other words, there's more persecution and more uh, animosity against Christians now. But as Pastor Dave so brilliant, brilliant so wonderfully explained earlier during the, the service, we win. We may lose the war on this planet. We may lose the war in this mortal life. We may lose the war in America, but we will win the ultimate battle for eternity. And that's what we need to hang on to because the promises of God are true. And that's why we're, when we take uh, part in communion now, we need to get this eternal perspective. We need to understand that the God of the universe is playing for eternity, not for here. 